Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Tyler Hadley? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Blake and Mary Jo Hadley were a married couple that lived in Port St. Lucie, Florida. They moved there in the mid-1980s to be closer to Blake's parents. Blake was a watch engineer at a nuclear power plant. Mary Jo was an elementary school teacher. The couple had a son, Ryan, in 1987, and another son, Tyler, in 1993. Tyler started receiving mental health counseling at age six after showing symptoms of depression. Evidently, his mother had suffered from depression as well. At age 10, he was prescribed antidepressant medication. By age 15, he was also prescribed the stimulant Adderall, as well as many other drugs. He continued to have symptoms of depression, and he developed low self-esteem. In high school, Tyler really didn't fit in. His behavior became unpredictable, and he was seeking attention. In 2010, Tyler and a few of his friends were arrested after setting fire to a couch. They only received a warning. So apparently they took this couch out into a wooded area and set it on fire, causing a significant sized fire in the area. So this was exceedingly dangerous. But somehow, again, they only ended up with a warning when a conviction probably would have been much more appropriate. Tyler was prescribed more medication. He started drinking, using marijuana, and using ecstasy. In April of 2011, Tyler was arrested for aggravated battery. He had attacked another individual. He was sentenced to one week in jail, then two weeks of house arrest. His mother took away his cell phone as part of his punishment. In June of 2011, Tyler's mother forced him to receive mental health counseling daily at a nearby agency. So as we move into 2011, his mother is very concerned with his condition, even more so than she was when he was younger. So there's a sense of urgency, like he really needs treatment because he's not able to regulate his mood. In early July 2011, Tyler started telling his friends that he was going to have a party at his house. His friends did not believe him because he had never thrown a party before, and Tyler's parents were known for being quite strict, especially considering the trouble that Tyler had been in recently. Not long after this, Tyler clarified his position. He said that he wanted to kill his parents and have a big party afterward. He thought this was novel because no one had ever done that before, throwing a party with the bodies of their parents still in the house. Several of his friends heard the statement, but nobody took him seriously. Tyler specifically mentioned killing his mother because she took away his cell phone. Around the same time, again in early July, Tyler's mother was telling friends that Tyler was over the hurdle. He was back to himself, and she was so happy. So before, we had seen the sense of urgency with the daily counseling, and now we see Tyler's mother seemingly unaware that his mood really has not improved. He has adopted an antisocial attitude, a very dangerous point of view, and his mother seems unaware. On July 16, 2011, at 11.25 a.m., 17-year-old Tyler communicated via Facebook to one of his friends. He wrote that he was trying to have a party at his house. The friend replied by asking if his parents were home. Tyler indicated they would be leaving soon. At 1.15 p.m., Tyler posted a message indicating that there might be a party at his house tonight. Just before 5 p.m., Tyler grabbed his parents' cell phones and took three ecstasy pills. He walked into the garage and retrieved a claw hammer. As his mother was working on a computer, he stood behind her for about five minutes, contemplating his next move. He then attacked her from behind with the hammer, killing her. Blake came out of the bedroom after hearing Mary Jo scream the word, why? Blake stood there staring at Tyler. He also asked Tyler, why? Tyler replied, why the blank not? Tyler then attacked his father with the hammer, killing him. Tyler hid the bodies of Blake and Mary Jo in the master bedroom of the house and worked for three hours to clean up the crime scene. He put all of the evidence in the master bedroom along with the bodies. After he was done cleaning, 
he stared at his reflection in the bathroom mirror and laughed. At 8.15 p.m., Tyler posted another message on Facebook indicating there was a party at his house. One of his friends replied, asking what if his parents were to come home. Tyler said, they won't, trust me. Over the next few hours, over 60 people arrived at Tyler's residence. Many were teenagers. Another large group would be those in their early 20s. Most of them did not know who Tyler was. Eventually, there were about 100 people there. The individuals engaged in a number of activities at the party. They searched the kitchen cupboards for food. They threw empty cans on a lawn. They shattered bottles on the floor. They smoked cigarettes and put them out on the kitchen counter, the walls, and the carpet. And they played beer pong on the dining room table. Some of the guests asked Tyler where his parents were. Tyler had a few different stories depending on who he was talking to. He said they were in Georgia, Orlando. He told one friend they didn't live there. He owned the house. At 12.30 a.m., Tyler, his friend Mark Andrews, and Mark's girlfriend went to a nearby gas station to buy beer. Mark Andrews was 21 years old, so he was able to do this. As Mark went in to purchase the beer, Tyler told Mark's girlfriend that his father had died. She assumed that Tyler meant this had happened some time ago, not just recently. After Tyler returned to the party, he encountered another teenager who had stolen the mailbox from a neighbor's house. The young man was running around the living room with the mailbox in his hands. Tyler yelled at him and said that stealing a mailbox was a felony and the police were going to show up. So he was okay with murder, but not with someone stealing a mailbox. That was really offensive to him. Another guest took the mailbox and put it back outside. When Mark Andrews was getting ready to leave the party, Tyler asked him for a word. They went outside and told the other guests to get back in the house. Here's how the conversation went between Tyler and Mark. Tyler said, I did some things. I might go to prison. I might go away for life. I don't know. I'm freaking out right now. Mark asked what he was talking about. Tyler answered, I know you're not going to believe me. No one will believe me. I killed somebody. Mark replied, you killing somebody is your own business. Don't be telling me that sort of thing. I don't need to know. Tyler went back into the house and the party continued. He told someone else that he was going to bring an end to his life because he did something really bad. He noted that if he got caught, he would be in jail for a long time. Tyler told a 20-year-old woman that he found in his bedroom that he would be going away for 60 years. At about 1 a.m., Tyler asked to speak privately to another one of his friends named Michael Mandel. He told Michael that he killed his parents. Michael did not believe him. Tyler pointed out that his father's Toyota Tacoma and his mother's Ford Expedition were parked at the house. How could they be away from the house if their vehicles were still there? Michael still did not believe him. Tyler invited Michael to the master bedroom and showed him the bodies of his parents. At this point, Michael believed him. Tyler proceeded to explain the entire story to Michael, how he killed his parents with a claw hammer, dragged their bodies into the master bedroom, and laughed while looking in the bathroom mirror. Michael decided to stay at the party for another 45 minutes. He took a number of selfies with Tyler. At around 2 a.m., one of the partygoers announced there was another party being thrown at another house. People started leaving Tyler's house and climbing in their cars. About 14 cars pulled away from Tyler's house at around the same time. When they arrived at the other house, they noticed it was dark. There was no party. It was just a rumor. All the cars pulling out of Tyler's neighborhood prompted a neighbor to call the police. When the police arrived at Tyler's house, fewer than 20 people remained at the party. The police told Tyler about the noise complaint and left. The party resumed, with some of the people who had left earlier returning. Tyler once again mentioned to people that he may bring an end to his life. At 4.40 p.m., Tyler posted another message indicating there was a party at his house. So I guess he wanted the party to continue into the morning. At around that same time, the police had arrived because Michael Mandel called them. Tyler opened the door and the officers arrested him. The officers entered the house. It was practically destroyed. There was trash everywhere. Furniture was overturned. The police forced their way into the master bedroom and found the bodies of Blake and Mary Jo. Tyler was arrested and eventually convicted of two murders and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. 
on appeal, his sentence was modified to life in prison with the possibility of parole. Now moving to my analysis. What happened to Tyler Hadley? Like what motivated him to kill? Here's my theory. I don't know, of course. This is just my opinion. Even though Tyler started exhibiting symptoms of depression at age six, people described him as respectful and polite. He was suffering, but it wasn't leading to any type of antisocial behavior. He had a number of physical illnesses when he was young, like hypothyroidism, which affected his self-esteem. His brother did not have physical illnesses, so Tyler felt as though he was at a disadvantage compared to his brother. He was on a number of medications for both mental and physical health conditions. At one point, he was put on human growth hormone. It appears as though his mother was very concerned about the low self-esteem in particular. She did not want him to be short or overweight. When he started high school, his behavior changed quite a bit. People described him as bizarre, hyper. They said he would laugh inappropriately. On one occasion in a biology class, he mooed like a cow out of nowhere. I guess as opposed to some type of cow mooing classroom exercise. It appears as though Tyler really wanted to fit in with a larger crowd in high school, not just his small circle of friends. But every time he tried, he appeared strange, aloof, and awkward. He started resorting to criminality to get attention. He was successful, but the strategy wasn't without its drawbacks. He became mad at his mother after she imposed sanctions on him, but at the same time, he was ashamed of his behavior, so he felt ambivalent. He had strong feelings in two directions. Perhaps Tyler started thinking that either he could please his peers or please his parents, but he could not have it both ways. He was motivated to choose one route or the other, and he really wanted the approval of his peers. The intense feelings of depression and hopelessness made a desperate big move more attractive, like he could do something significant and attract a lot of attention all at once. He could pull himself out of the pain, out of the depression. As he was standing behind his mother holding a claw hammer, the moment of decision was at hand. He had taken drugs beforehand to elevate his confidence and lower his inhibition. He wanted to make a bad decision. Tyler decided to remove the obstacles to his big party, namely his parents. He wanted his one moment of massive popularity this opportunity to be well-liked, to have friends, to be thought of as cool. It was his moment of glory, but immediately he realized there would be no great payoff. He confessed to several people. He was nervous about the consequences of his behavior, specifically spending his life in prison. The last part I want to cover is the behavior of the hundred or so young people who came to the party at the Hadley residence. The town of Port St. Lucie is two hours north of Miami, Florida, it is home to a disproportionately high number of teenagers, has an expansive illegal marijuana production industry, and not a lot of activities available for young people. This is a recipe for misbehavior. There are a few really surprising behaviors from these partygoers. Just a few examples. Some of them smelled a stench when they were in the house, like perhaps a dead body, but nobody said anything. The partygoers destroyed the residence, tore up the furniture, spilled alcohol everywhere, broke beer bottles. It was like a bomb went off in the house. I can't imagine this is a routine behavior, as most people would be mad if their homes were destroyed, but perhaps this was somewhat common. It was almost like when they were given the freedom to do whatever they wanted, they really let loose. Their true impulsivity and destructiveness were unleashed. Even though many of the guests at the party were too young to drink, it appears as though just about everybody did. I think the lesson learned from the situation with the partygoers is that young people require supervision. I think it's tempting for parents and guardians to let their children do whatever they want. They want to appear easygoing so they can facilitate a good relationship. They don't want to seem to be heavy-handed or strict. In reality, these young people spent the evening and the early morning with a person who had just beat two people to death with a hammer only a few hours before. I guess another lesson here would be that communities should have activities available for young people which involve less alcohol, property destruction, and murder. Less murder is almost always a good idea if one wants to build a healthy and productive community. Those are my thoughts in the case of Tyler Hadley. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comments section. They always generate 
and interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis to be as exciting as an out-of-control party. Thanks for watching.